work. In addition to my grandmother, I told you I grew up in Jamaica, I had a prime minister by the name of Michael Manley. And before decolonization and all of that was sort of a, 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 a construct that's sort of so ubiquitous in the global north and so on, there were people in the Caribbean doing this work. Michael Manley, our post-colonial uh, prime minister in Jamaica, he passed a law that said no bastard, no dead. Up until that time, a child born in Jamaica out of wedlock was called a bastard. And so he passed a law to say, no bastard, no day. Oh, no bastard, no day. That's my Jamaican uh, language. So that's so important. All of those people informed my work, informed my thinking. The work of Walter Rodney, when I went to university, how Europe underdeveloped Africa. You should read it if you've never read it. Get it and read it because you realize that the conversations that we're having today have been going on in all of these spaces. So I wanted to share a little bit of who I am with you so you can get a sense of my journey and you can get a sense of what I call my entry point into the conversation. So. The, the, when I've looked at the, uh, the, the, the UCA theme, working for and with equity towards leadership and leadership towards sustainability, it really caused me to pause and think and reflect deeply on how can I connect to this? How can I build on this so that we can continue the work in the times in which we're living? in these challenging times, especially in the US, when white Christian nationalism seems hell-bent, and yes, I say hell-bent, on erasing histories and creating a society where only white people can feel comfortable. And, and that is, we, we have to begin to think about how we as critical educators, how we as educators who want to see change, who want to challenge all of the oppression, who want justice, who want th children to thrive, we have to begin to think, how are we going to do this work in the context within which we find ourselves, particularly my brothers and sisters in the United States. And I'm not going to get all smug about Canada. I live in Ontario. And as you know, just like the cold weather flows down, you know, much of what happens here also flows across the, the, the border as well. So we are also um, faced with, uh, maybe not to the same extent, but we're also faced with some of those issues and some of those conversations. And so um, I wanted to then talk about the, the title of, of, of the conversation, Keeping the Vibe, and why the Bob Marley music was playing. Because I think if we are going to keep the fight going, if we are going to keep the work going, we are going to have to find a way to sustain ourselves. And so, as I think I went to a session today, they were talking about black women. Um, I, got the, the, I got there a little bit late, but the, the conversation was around the work of black women. And I want to say the work should not kill us. The work should not kill us. So then how do we keep the vibe going? How do we keep the energy going? How do we keep the positive vibrations going? Because when children thrive, when our students thrive, when we see change in the work that we're doing, it is a cause for celebration. And so we've learned a lot from COVID. And I think sometimes we forget that in the US here, one million people died. Across the world, 6.2, 6.62 million died. So we've learned a lot, but we cannot forget. We cannot forget um, what we've learned from, from, from the pandemic and the lessons are still ongoing. So while we work towards this greater equity, while we work towards this sustainability, we have to bring with us the lessons, the insights that we've gained. And so we must ask ourselves, if equity should not become a treadmill, a, a sort of 
or things that we're doing over and over. You, and, and I'll share a little bit about our Ontario context, where we were having the conversations in 1992 about black students not um, achieving their full potential. We are still having the same conversations today. And I'm sure it's not just Ontario, it's in other spaces as well. So then we have to ask ourselves, how do we embed and sustain this work? Because we know it is good work. We know it is for our students, and we know it is for a better society. And I've been saying to my, to my, to my grad students and, and so on in spaces I've been, we also want to say to, to, to students who are uh, from high resourced communities, students who have privilege, when we challenge injustices, it benefits everyone. So sometimes the way that the conversation is, is, is presented is as if we're doing this for black and brown and indigenous kids only. We're doing it for all kids. As Gloria Latson Billings says, it's just good teaching and I say it's just good leadership. So when we, when we think about embedding and sustaining this work, we're thinking about creating change that lasts. How many of us, we, we, we talk about exhaustion. The work exhausts us. If we're doing the same thing over and over, and we're not seeing and feeling the results, then we feel exhausted. So that's the whole idea of keeping the vibes, having the positive vibrations, and I hope you enjoyed a little bit of Bob Marley when you walked in. And by the way, I want to say something about Bob Marley. Can I ask you to stop romanticizing Bob Marley and just read the lyrics? So many people, they go, oh, they want to do Bob Marley. His, his, his lyrics are revolutionary. It's a, it was music of resistance. And I think sometimes, you know, I go into spaces and I'm, have you read the lyrics? It is music of resistance. So may I encourage you to read the words of his songs. It's really, really good. Okay. So there is a, there is a need for equity education. And, and, and I call that in my work, the agreement. So when we go into spaces to do this work now, at least when I go into spaces to do this work now, I really, my entry point is, can we have some agreements? Because I'm not going to expend energy having conversations whether white supremacy is a thing or whether oppression really exists and we go through those and we spend so much energy into spaces having conversations around things that we should have agreements about. Now, how we, 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 we challenge, how we, we, we change, how we engage, now of course we have conversations around that, but we shouldn't be, I, I find sometimes we spend a lot of energy uh, trying to have conversations around things that we should have agreements about. And so drawing a little bit on my Ontario context, and I hope I'm sh showing the right slides there, drawing a little bit on my Ontario context, the, in, in Ontario, for example, um, we've had research just in 2017 that showed, Jameson Turner, that showed that black students were not achieving to their full potential in the greater Toronto area. So I, I, I raised that to say and to share my context to give you a sense that yes, there is need for this work. And the, the research tells us that and the stories tell us that as well. Within the US, the conversations around anti-woke and anti-CRT also says to us that there is need for this work. And I just want to pause for a little bit and talk about this anti-woke um, sort of movement. It is really saddens me, and I'm sure it saddens you as well, how much the, the, the right really has appropriated the word woke that was supposed to be, that is about justice and liberation and is weaponizing it. And we really have to f fight back. We have to speak back to that. And we really have to say, to reclaim it. And we have to think about how we do that. And so I just wanna say that as we gather both in person and virtually that there is need for this work. And so I want to just talk 
Now, I wish I had my, I should put my slides up here to see where I'm at here. But anyway, we will just go, go, go with me here. Um, and so as we talk about embedding equity and sustaining it, I want to say something about performative equity work, what I call laminated equity, feel good equity, wind addressing equity, the DEI projects now that are, <laughs> you know, it, 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 it what do I call the DEI project? It's almost a way to stop the revolution. They will have a DEI project. It's, it's, we really have to begin to think about a lot of the, the neoliberal approach to this equity work. That's really growing like, like it's just sort of taking over. And I think I was saying to somebody today, when we, when we go into spaces to do this kind of DEI work, we should ask, ask what is structurally going to change? What, what exactly do, am I here to do? Am I here just to adjust the curtains? When I say it as a metaphor, am I here just to, to sort of make people feel good that they're doing something? So when we talk about this equity work, I really, it's very important for me to say that we have to be mindful of performative equity. Because many institutions, uh, some people are doing equity work, I've been in the schools, I've been in the context where folks are doing equity, but they cannot name whiteness. They're doing equity, but cannot say white supremacy. They're doing equity, but they cannot say decolonization. They're doing equity, so they're not, they cannot, but they cannot say decolonia, decol, decoloniality. So what exactly are you doing? Let me stop and ask, what exactly are you doing? If you're doing equity, and you cannot name it. So, 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 so as we talk about embedding and sustaining, we have to recognize that the journey is complex, it's contextual, and it is nuanced. But we have to also be very mindful of exactly what we're doing in terms of, of equity. So I, I wanted to just, uh, I'm going to skip over. I just wanted to sort of share a little bit of the Ontario context. I have a link, you can look at it because many uh, school systems in Ontario, and I'm sure here in the US as well, we have, I think somebody asked me today about our districts, we have school boards. And so they have now school boards and it's called the Board Improvement Equity Plans. And that trick goes down to the School Improvement Equity Plan. And that's, um, I share that to say that whether it is in the United States or it is in Canada, many organizations and, and school boards are, are sort of doing equity. And so the idea again is what does that look like? What are the conversations we're having? And as a, in, in Ontario, I was just um, working with some school leaders talking about and looking at how do we um, think about data? You know, how do we think about sort of what is evidence-based? How do we disrupt that? How do we um, go behind what the data are telling us and so on? So I'll, I'll pass on that and keep it moving. As I talk now in terms around when I say embedding equity and, and, and sustaining it, what is my entry point and, and how am I conceptualizing? And I call that critical equity. And I know the word critical is sort of used in, in many ways, but I just wanna say that when I'm talking about equity and doing the work, I'm positioning it within history and struggle and contestations. We cannot do equity work if we're not challenging settler colonialism that is ever present through the occupation of land and language and culture and ways that communities understand themselves and the world. We, 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 equity work can no longer be a feel-good project. We've got to where we're in our schools and in our, in, our, um, in our district meetings and in our principal preparation courses and all of those things. How are we preparing our school leaders to have these conversations? How are we preparing our school leaders when we're doing equity work to, to engage in ways that disrupt and dislodge colonial practices that have perpetuated? What does that look like? 
when I'm talking about this critical equity, I'm also talking about alternative research methodologies. I was at AERA this year, and the, 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 the culminating lecture in, in sort of for, for AERA, and AERA is inviting us not to show up with the, the sort of same, you know, here's the methodology, here's what I'm doing. Bring your songs, bring the stories, bring the video projects, bring all of those alternative ways of doing the work, of getting the voices, of getting the narratives into space. And for me, that is the critical equity work. You know, what are we, how are we engaging our students? How are we engaging our students in their own in their own work? How are they uh, and being engaged in the space? I was in a session this morning with a principal who was sharing her own transformation and her own um, sort of uh, going along her journey um, to where she was sort of disciplining students to lovingly redirecting them. And that is so important. We have to wrestle with the epistemological and ontological concerns in the work. And that's also important. I, I, the, the word that we like to use is tribal. But I do not use that word. What we are trying to find are solidarities. That's what we're trying to find. Because, you know, the word tribal is, I find it to be a very um, hegemonic term that's used here in the West. When you go to the continent of Africa, people are in tribes. And, and it's not a, a, a competitive thing. That's your ancestral connections. So all of that is important and we must also be challenging power. And we must have talked about how we must examine how data are used. And of course, we must ensure that we are recentering indigenous knowledge and practices. And, you know, um, the yesterday, I want to take a, a brief moment to reflect on yesterday's session, where we all sat in silence and listened. We all sat in silence and listened. It was so amazing. So when we're doing equity work and we were trying to sustain, we're, we're sort of centering indigenous black 2S LGBTQ plus students and experiences, how do we sit in silence and listen to those stories? That's also part of the equity work. How do we hold those stories? In your department meetings, how are you holding those stories? In your school team meetings, how are you holding those stories? All of that is part of the equity work. So that's the entry point. So the key question, therefore, I, I, I really want us to think about and to have, hopefully, you're, we're going to have some conversations about, is then how is the system, how do we change a system grounded in equity? How is it achieved, supported, and sustained? And what kind of leadership is necessary to sustain that work? And when I say what kind of leadership, I'm not just talking about sort of the, the, the mechanics of the work. The, the, I'm talking about leadership that, of course, it, it's, it's also the, 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 the person, it's also the lived experiences of that leader. It's also the space, it's the context. So much um, goes into, in, into that work and, and, and what are the supports that, that folks need to do that work. So let's hold on to those two key questions. So then, having said all of that, having given you my story, sort of shared my entry point into the work, sort of create the contextual framework of how I'm thinking about equity, and I'm giving you the invitation, it's an invitation to join me in that thinking, to join me in that reimagining. So what I'm sharing with you in terms of ways that we can embed and sustain are some ideas that I, I'm hoping that we can, we can have some conversations about. So the first one I wanted to, so the, the, the talk I, I kind of said, you know, we, we have to look at community building and I'll talk a little bit more about that, discerning and rejoicing. And I have come to these understandings of how to do the work, of how to embed and to sustain in t based on my, not just my research, but my own lived experiences. And really um, reflecting and having that, that sort of critical 
engagement in thinking about how do I get off that exhausted treadmill of equity? How do I, how do I begin to feel that I'm, I'm having a little bit of, of, of impact? How do I do that? How, how do we create that space? How do, we, how do we wrestle with those tensions so we're not talking about the same thing, reading the same data year in, year out? So I'm going to share some ideas around community building that I am I'm suggesting that community building is not this kumbaya thing. It's not like we're just all going to just get along and, and, and or it's, I'm talking about genuine solidarity across spaces. How do you build solidarity with someone who is different from you? How do we build solidarity into communities that we do not know anything about? That you're just a new principal, you're a new superintendent, you've been, you've been uh, hired into a, new, into a new district. How do we build um, th th that solidarity across space? And what I'm suggesting is that when we talk about community, there are multiple axes and that there are historical narratives. And so if, 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 if you're a superintendent or a, a principal, or you might have even been in the school district for a while and some of us maybe be in higher ed, when you're in those spaces and you're thinking about community building, what are you thinking about? How do you engage in community building? How do you, what does that look like for you? And you know, I had to unlearn a few things. I had to relearn a few things. I am a black woman, a descendant of the enslaved, born and raised in Jamaica. I do not know everything about every other community. There are some religions I've never been exposed to. How do we have that conversation? How, and that is the community building. How do we create space for those stories with our students and with our colleagues? How do we open up space for self-emancipation, that collective consciousness and communal liberation? And I think that as we're, we're doing this work and we talk about liberatory praxis and we talk about liberation, we want to be liberated from oppression we want our students to be liberated from oppression. We want our students, as Bettina Love says, to be into spaces where they can thrive. You know, that we have a whole industry about resilience. Let me take a moment and pause and talk about resilience. Can may I ask you to stop telling our children to be more resilient in spaces that are oppressing them? Let me say it again. When we talk about resilience, change the school space. Change the space and stop telling children to be more resilient. To, 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 you, we, there is not enough resiliency to overcome oppression. There is not enough resiliency when a child is beaten down, you know, put upon. There is not enough. That's the reason for all of some of the trauma that we're experiencing. And I, I, there's this whole thing after COVID that was popping up and everybody's doing resiliency. Resiliency is a wonderful thing to have. But resiliency in the face of oppression must be reconceptualized differently. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm not saying resiliency is a bad thing. We all need it. You know, I need resiliency to, to go to the gym and get my 10,000 steps. <laughs> oh, tell me about it. It's hard work. But, what, but I'm not feeling oppressed while I'm trying to get my 10,000 steps. So when kids walk into school, and this idea that you expect black people and brown people and indigenous people to be more resilient and then be more resilient, change the system, change the systems of oppression. And we continue to talk about that. Discerning. This is from my grandmother. And sometimes, you know, equity is polysemous, it's everywhere, it's multifaceted, and it's contested. And of course, sometimes, we, all of us, all of us are implicated, we fall into the neoliberal trope. We go into our school boards, we go into our schools, we go into our districts, and we, you, and, and it, it's, we, 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 we 
we kind of just fall in line. And for, we have to be discerning. We have to have that third eye because sometimes injustice is, doesn't comes in different forms. It, it's, and so that's the discerning. So when we're looking at this work and we're trying to embed and we're trying to sustain, we have to unsettle those neoliberal narratives. We have to unsettle them, and we must ask alternative questions. And you know, my entry point into this work now, after 30 years and taking the, the, you know a, a few setbacks and a few rough roads and and so on and, and all of those things, you know, you learn, you unlearn, you 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 you, 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 you use those experiences and narratives and stories. Now I have learned how to ask those alternative questions. I have learned how to enter this space, and I was speaking with Dr. Mullen around the idea of, for me right now, where I'm at in my journey, is not to create spirit injury, but is to have an invitation, is to invite people into the work. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about how do I do that? Because if you're, if you're a superintendent or you're a principal in a particular context, because this work is contextual, and you, you do not have anyone else to support the work you're doing. We had better learn how to do that invitation. We'd better learn because, of course, we can't do this work by ourselves. So there's so much into that. So we have to be discerning. And in discerning, in discerning, I'm going to share. I've also now learned, learned when to yield for another day. I have now learned in my discerning that if I can't win this fight today, I better go get some, some help and come back tomorrow. And so you might be in a school district where right now that, that, that policy that you're trying to implement, which we know is good, you just don't have enough supports to get you there. Go get your backup and come back. You'd, we do not have to put ourselves, we do not have to sacrifice ourselves um, right in the moment. That's a discerning. It is an understanding. It is all of those intricacies and nuances that, we, that we, 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 we have to come to see and come to know. And also, the last thing I want to share, and I'm going to go into some more of these in detail, is creating space in the work for joy. That's keeping the vibes. We have to see joy as resistance, and I'm learning that. You know, it's so funny. Um, we sometimes sit in trauma so much we forget joy. And we, 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 our histories are so painful that we forget joy. But we must remember that our ancestors used to sing, and they used to rejoice. And we, we must not forget that in the work, because that's a source of sustenance as well. And so just quickly, um, I just want to take a deeper dive into a few of these, the, into, into, into some of the notions here. Um, as I've said, uh, the, the, when we talk about community, we're talking about grounding the work in solidarities. And I want to, again, I want to come back to this a little bit, that when as oppressed peoples, and, and you know, I'd, I'd sort of, again, be very mindful of how we, of how we sort of label ourselves as oppressed people we the system oppresses us and uh, you know if you follow me on twitter you'll know that uh, i'm always about language um we do not speak of marginalized students but students marginalized by the system you know we students do not want to show up in school and you know have have sort of feel like they're constantly being labeled but so so that's for another time we can talk about that but we must come to see our futures as inextricably linked and that we have to be careful as we're building this community and, and working in, in towards this community liberation that we have to be mindful. And these are some cautions about seeing equity in those narrow terms. And I drew on the, the, the work of Bon here, um, who again talks about how much equity has been weaponized. And within the context in with which we find ourselves, when there is so much diversity happening in schools, it is very easy, and we're seeing it as those refugees are taking what we have. So, and those people are coming to take what we have. And, and, and we have to be very careful of how neoliberalism and white supremacy create those constructs that we fall into. 
So I'm suggesting and opening the invitation that we think about when we think about community, we think about this work, we think about our, our solidarities across our various identities. And that's how we are going to embed and sustain the work. And so I've already talked about uh, community space and multiple access. I just want to share um, something uh, in, in this idea around relationality that our indigenous brothers and sisters um, shared with us yesterday, and that's really part of indigenous work. In, in our university and schools, we have embedding indigenous knowledge, and we use a lot of the, the ideas of relationality. And, and, and there's a writer, I think she's from Australia, Lauren Tynan, and she writes that relationality is learned from the stories. Watching our old people yarn or sitting with country, sitting with country. Relationality is seldom learned from academic journal articles. And so here we are at UCA. Of course, we're going to come and be in community. And I have an exercise for all of you. I'm coming up, you know, I was a classroom teacher. There shall always be an activity. But she also talks about this idea that the relationships are spiritual and there's a cultural foundation for indigenous people. And so it's really how we include all of these stories and, and what are the responsibilities that we take onto ourselves to get to know one another in these kinds of, 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 of relationships. But relationality is that idea of connecting to the stories, to the land. And, and I want you to sit with that for a bit. And if you haven't really spent time um, reading about um, the ways in which indigenous folks um, sort of um, embrace relationality, I urge you, really urge you to do that. So my question to you then is, how do we create the space for those stories? And so drawing on the work of Asante, again, um, I offer the notion of community solidarity forged through cultural products, depicted and shared resistance of colonialism, anti-blackness, anti-indigenous, anti-Asian. So we talk about those colonial, those cultural products. How do we find those solidarities across different, uh, across different identities? And sometimes, you know, um, I'm really, I'm still uh, struggling. Now I use global majorities now, and I'm sure you're struggling to say black indigenous people of color, the BIPOC term that I am a little bit not uncomfortable with. Anybody else uncomfortable with the BIPOC term? That, that kind of in some ways others, you know, um, folks with uh, all, other all identities. So again, I think we have to think about how we create that space and have those conversations. And when we talk about the cultural products, particularly in our schools and in our school districts, how are we engaging and, and using those cultural products to build community? That's the point I'm trying to make. And so these multiple intersections and histories and so on. Something I also want to say about, um, about um, community building and, and, and sort of using this critical approach and using the, the cultural products and so on, we have to engage with the tensions. Equity doesn't mean absence of tensions. Equity means recognizing the tensions, acknowledging the tensions, and, and collaboratively figuring out how we, we navigate those tensions. Because there are tensions. We, we have them in our schools all the time. We have them in our, in, in, our, in our universities all the time. Because remember, neocolonialism colonialism and the new form of colonialism, neocolonialism, create racial hierarchies. And if we are not careful, we sometimes buy into those racial hierarchies. Have you ever heard the conversation in the staff room about this kid and that kid, who has potential and who hasn't? Who has the potential for X and who doesn't have the potential for Y and so on and so forth. So, but we cannot build community if we do not acknowledge those tensions. So once we do that, I am suggesting that we'll have a greater opportunity of embedding and sustaining. So let me, um, before I go on to discerning, 
I have a little activity for you, and it's something that has been on my mind. I go to a lot of conferences and so on. I'm going to ask you now to get up and find somebody in this room that you do not know. Get up or turn, because we can't be up here talking about community building, and we come to AERA with the group that we've come to, and we're going to leave with the same group. So, and, and that is something that, you know, I, I am intentionally walking up to people and saying hello and so on. And that's some good, and it gets, up, it gets us up out of our chairs as well. Please find someone and just somebody who you do not know. We cannot have fake community building. <laughs> Okay, I guess we needed that. Cardi might have to put the music on. <laughs> okay, folks, say goodbye to your new friend, and let's keep it going. <laughs> and I can't see you. Um, folks, let's get back. I'm going to have to use my teacher voice. Let's regroup. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. We needed that. Okay, folks, let's keep it moving. Thank you so much for taking up my invitation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We needed that, didn't we? We needed that. Yes, that's community. We needed that. All right. And, and, and so... When we talk about community building, the question is not a theoretical construct. It's not a theoretical construct. It is real, it happens, and how do we engage? And so often, we come to these spaces and we do our theories and we do our presentations and we, we kind of hang with the people that we know we came with, but there's so much to learn. There's so much to learn across the space. There's so much to learn. So thank you for taking up my invitation. That, that was really great. Thank you so much. So now I just want to talk a little bit about discerning. Just want to take a deeper dive into that. Um, and as I've said before, um, it's, it's also recognizing some of the things that are hidden or obscure some of the biases that we have. So now you've, you've gotten up, thank you for that. So now I'm going to do, ask you to engage in another activity that will not require you to get up. But it's going to require you to either take out your phone or your notepad, I'm very tactile, so I still like paper, and take a, few, a minute to begin to reflect on something that's in your belly that you need to excavate. Some bias, something that you really haven't paid attention to that you need to reflect on and excavate so that you can then be free to move across spaces. And I'll give 30 seconds for that. I, I, I share a quick example. Uh, because all of us, if we do not examine, you know, the things we are carrying around based on our own socialization, it sometimes creeps up on us, creep up, creeps up on us. So I'm going, so that's another part of the discerning. Discerning what's, I, what's in there to be excavated because the work begins with self write it down, you do not have to tell anyone. 
Okay, so it's, it's, it's thank you again for accepting that invitation of really sort of reflecting what's in the belly, what's in the craw, what is there that I need to excavate, that I need to reflect on, that I need to work on. That's part of the discerning. We discern others, we discern spaces, we discern context, and we must also be in touch with self. Because that critical work begins with self. And I hope I'm on the right slide here, where Bun also reminds us, as we're doing this equity work, that we must be careful of representational violence. Where the very people we seek to represent in our equity work are excluded. And this representational violence happens when we're in those meetings in our districts and in our workshops, and in our spaces. And Bunn argues that this violence can be twofold. That is both the act setting of the parameters of epistemic categories. And where's my new friend Lola? And uh, my new best friend Lola. And Lola was just talking about that epistemic um, categorization today in our workshop where people kind of look at her, do not know, and they sort of just place her in a space. And of course, Bun says, these are discourses by professionals and elites and lock, lack of access to representation. Of course, that marginalizes groups that are being represented. So in this discerning, in the work, we also have to, and do not use the word blind spot anymore because there are um, ability issues around that. I use the word, we must look for our vulnerable spots. And do not use the word color blindness anymore. I use the words color evasiveness. So language is also very important. So as we're looking at our vulnerable spots, as we're beginning, as we're discerning and doing all of that work, we must be mindful that we're not engaging in representational violence. The ways in which we are thinking about, working through, and sort of position, positioning um, groups marginalized by the system. And, and Bunn argues that when we get into these equity categories, um, of the pre-constructed ways that, that sometimes neutralizes many of our cultures, identities, and personhoods that exist beyond the objectives of policymakers and institutional administrators. And I take a pause. How often are we as superintendents, as principals in those meetings, talking about our students in a particular kind of way? You know, two, two terms I hear every time I go to conferences that I have a dissonance with. School to prison pipeline and free and reduced lunch. Which child wants, why do we do it? I know the system uses that as a way of placing resources. But when we talk about students who are, we do it so willy-nilly. Oh, they, 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 are, they, are, they can get free and reduced lunch. We're talking about other people's children. Which child wants to go to school and believe that they labeled as the one that's getting free and reduced lunch? Nobody sends their child to school to be in a school to prison pipeline. So it is, let's just reconstruct it. The ways in which schools, um, the ways in which schools fail students and so they do not achieve. How about we change the language? As I said, I, I tweeted out, if I go one more place and see one more thing about the school to prison pipeline, I do not know if I'm going to hold it in. Because, <laughs> because, it, 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 it's, it's a system that's failing the children. So this school to prison pipeline, let's get rid of it. No child wants to feel that they're in a pipeline on the way to prison. And so the language that we use, all of this is the discernment. It is, it, it's sort of the, the things that we take for granted. And so again, I ask us to think about our, our school systems. Think about the, you know, the, when we engage in this work, think about um, if we're engaging in any of this representational violence, epistemic violence, and, 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 and are we, how are we 
what are we inflicting in the space? And that's part of that discernment. So that little activity, that belly thing that you did, that reflecting, that sort of, hmm, that might be a vulnerable spot. That is, that is something that we have to do if we want to ensure that the work is sustained and it's embedded and, and, and we can keep it moving. And so, I'm going to skip this one. I hope I'm at the right place. I'm not even going to worry about it. it we'll, we'll, we'll just keep going. Um, so, I now want to get to joy. Am I on to joy? Wonderful, yes. I really wanted to, to, to get to here. Um, because we cannot do this work if we're tired. So what I'm saying in my invitation is that to embed and to sustain equity work, we need to do this community building, but in a particular kind of way. We need to be discerning, but we must also be having some joy. Because we can't do the work if I'm tired. Now, joy in the way I'm thinking about it is not, doesn't mean the absence of our histories or pain and so on. And I want to share a, a little bit of a, my, my personal story. You know, um, I have now, over time, um, when I go into spaces, I, am, I oftentimes say, I am not able to engage with, with pain and trauma today. My, my, my story doesn't always have to be data for someone else. Because our stories are data. When we go into a space and we share our lived experiences, that's data. That's our life. That's our stories. But we must know that we do not always have to go into these spaces and, 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 and sort of be in that space of pain all the time. The, the, because oppression is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. You know, uh, I tell people all the time that yes, I'm a professor. All of us here are in different areas and so on, students and so on. We do not walk around in society with a t-shirt that says professor. So when we show up, we show up with our blackness, with our dreadlocks, with our accents, with our whatever in our bags. If you're like me, I carry many bags. And oftentimes, the, the, the microaggressions or the aggressions that we experience in those spaces as a result of our, of our aspects of our identity. So when I talk about this joy, what I'm suggesting is that we shift the paradigm. That equity work means that there must be 28 hours in a day. There, that equity work has no boundary, it has no borders. And I think we were talking about that in a session today as well, um, a session on black and the work of black women. And so in order to sustain this work, we have to sustain um, our equity workers. We have to sustain ourselves. We do not, it doesn't mean that we have to, we have to give to the point where there's nothing left in here. You know, um, I actually had somebody, it was a student actually who said to me, Dr. Lopez, you're taking care of everyone. Who is taking care of you? Who is taking care of you? In your organizations, who is taking care of you? So we really have to ask ourselves that question in addition to are we taking care of ourselves? We must take care of ourselves. And so we've come to recognize and that joy is important. And we must show that joy. We must show that joy. Because as uh, I can't remember who says, that as people fighting for liberation, we've come to realize that joy is important aspect of doing this work. And it was Alice Walker who says that resistance is a secret of joy. I used to say when I was a classroom teacher and I was a school principal doing equity work, I used to say, if we walk around in the schools, look like social justice work is, is sort of burdening us down, why would anybody want to be part of that? <laughs> I'm serious. If you're always tired, busy, um, running, going, people look at it, I don't want, you can keep that. And now, post 
COVID or maybe we're not post COVID, but in this world that we're in, we recognize that 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 we, it, it doesn't have to be done that way. We can pace ourselves. You know, we are not going to undo 500 years of whatever it was in one day, or in one workshop, or in, 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 in one space. And that joy in resisting oppression, uh, we must embrace that. And we've, you know, we've talked a lot about black joy, and many of us are now sort of just, just enjoy, living in black joy. Because that's what keeps us, that's what sustains us. You know, um, it's good for our mental health and well-being. It's good for, it's, it's just good for us as human beings because it keeps us going and helps us to do that work. So when we're thinking, therefore, of embedding and sustaining equity, th these are the things that I'm encouraging you to think about. Those are the things that I have been thinking about. Am I good at it? No, I'm still working at it. Uh, it's a work in progress for me. And you know, it's Audre Lorde who says, um, who wrote, caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation. And that is an act of political warfare. And doing equity work, where the legacy of white supremacy and systemic inequality means that black joy is a radical act of defiance and a refusal to accept the narratives filtered through the white gaze. And I think in, in, we were talking, in, 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 there is in the session today around the idea of black people living under the white gaze and, 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 and construction of who we are. And when we enter spaces, that there's this notion that there, that there's some kind of work that we are going to do. And we do not have to live to that white gaze. You know, it doesn't mean if we are the, the, the one black professor at the university that we have to take on all of the work of, of, of caring and nurturing and, and loving and all of that. We also have to, 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 to be mindful that we must uh, self-preserve as well. And of course, that's part of the resistance and part of the joy. So I want to end um, on this idea that when we find joy in the work, we're better able to resist the cultural dislocations, estrangement, and alienation. I think I went ahead a little bit. Okay, joy is also for our students as well. I really want to say that too. It's very important as we're talking about joy, that we also have to think about our students, that when we engage in this work, they want to see us having some joy as well. And then they, because students, they also have agency to, to do this work and to help us to sustain and to keep going. And so, as I conclude, I just want to say, um, for lasting change to occur and for equity work to be sustained and embedded, we must develop a praxis that gets us of what I call the equity treadmill. And we have to create new futurities constructed with critical equity that decenters coloniality, Eurocentricity, and white supremacy. If we are not decentering and making that epistemological shift, we're only exhausting ourselves. And we're going to do that through community building, by discerning, and by having joy. Because it's an act of resistance. The kind of leadership that we need to do that must be bold, it must be daunting, and also the kind of leadership that creates space for the work and to sustain the work. It's, 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 it's that kind of leadership where we're going to have to learn, unlearn, and relearn. We're going to have to know what we don't know. That's also very important. And in that leadership work, I also want to say as I conclude that it doesn't have to be singular leadership. This idea of you're doing it by yourself, I want to say that there has to be collective leadership. There has to be collective leadership. And so my call to all of us here, online and in this room, we're researchers, researchers 
I do not like the word practitioners, but I use it anyway because people in school theorize, you know. Every time we think of doing it a different way, we're making theory. To the grad students, community members, let's keep the vibe going. Notwithstanding the challenges, notwithstanding where we find ourselves today, notwithstanding all of the struggles that are happening, let's keep the vibe going because we know it is what is good for our students, it's what is good for us, it's what's good for all students of all identities, and it's what's good for our communities, and it's what's good for the world. So we are going to keep going. And I want to just quickly add one piece as well. We have got to find also transnational solidarities. I'm urging you, encouraging all of us to get out of this idea of the global north and, and sort of the knowledge that resides here. There is knowledge on the continent of Africa that needs to flow this way, and that must flow this way. There's knowledge in Asia. There's knowledge in other parts of the world, and sometimes, sometimes we just get a little too comfortable in the knowledge that's produced from the global north and the west. So again, that's also part of doing this work. And so as I end, let's resist the neoliberal white supremacy antics that act act on racial hierarchies created by white supremacy to obstruct equity and this radical work. Let's find joy, let's resist, and let's have camaraderie in the work. I thank you all for inviting me into space. Make way. Thank you so much. And by the way, my